coming today. I, how's the audio? Is that pretty good? Excellent. Um, I'm Eric Irvin. I'm the CEO and founder of Reality Shares. We're an ETF company focused exclusively on dividend growth. And today, we want to talk about something that's um, it's hopefully going to change the way you think about investing. It's a it's pretty simple concept, but it's something that's been done by institutional investors, foundations, endowments for years. And, and it's really something that I used to caution my clients and help them understand <clears throat> is really the best way to manage your portfolio for retirement and retirement income. And I was a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley for 20 years plus, not, not billionaire clients, but certainly five to $100 million type net worth. And the one common thing that everyone, didn't matter if, even if, if they had $100,000 or if they had $100 million, was how do I get retirement income? It, it's, it's kind of ironic to think, but but they didn't know, how do I get my portfolio to generate an income for me that I can live off of? And, and the, the trick is, is not to invest in securities that pay that kind of income that you need. It's to invest in a portfolio and then pull that income from the portfolio. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. I'll give you a few tips, a few tricks that you can use in your own portfolios and then Finally, if, um, if, if interested, we'll open it up for questions at the end. And I can stay as long as you guys need in order to answer questions. So, so Reality Shares, as I mentioned, is, is a firm exclusively focused on dividend growth. We're an ETF issuer, exchange traded fund issuer. All of our ETFs in one way or another are based on this concept of, of dividend growth investing. And there's really a central theme there that, that we'll talk about, but if you, if you look at the awards that we've won and the different awards that we've been nominated for, I, I think it's countless awards that we've been nominated for, the common thread amongst all of those awards is our commitment to delivering better institutional quality investment solutions to the individual investor. That was. I mean, that was really why I left Morgan Stanley. I had a very successful financial practice at Morgan Stanley. And I was so frustrated that these clients were, were able to access all of these investment solutions, but my, my mom couldn't. And, and that was what killed me. You know, it just was so frustrating to see these, these like institutional, you know, pensions, endowments, all of those different solutions, and yet, my mom couldn't invest in those same things. And so I left Morgan Stanley to start this firm in order to deliver those same high quality investment solutions, but so individual investors could get them. No minimums, no high fees, no barriers to entry, and really the best quality investment solutions with, with the access that individual investors could get. And so our mission, and every one of our employees would, would tell you, and, and I welcome you to stop by our booth. I think it's 704 at the, um, in the convention hall. But every single one of our employees breathes, eats, sleeps this. It's how do we get our clients more of what they want and less of what they don't want. More returns, more transparency, more education, less volatility, less fees, less of all the taxes and all the, the issues that they don't want. And that's and less frustration, less anxiety. That's really what we're focused on. And everything that we do has that. <clears throat> so this is, um, this is really the backdrop of, of life as we know it right now. It's great. We're all living longer. That's fantastic. The problem is, is we need our money to live just as long as we do. And and stocks and, and bonds and markets in general are just volatile, right? So we have to deal with all of this stomach acid that goes along with investing. It's, it's kind of a, a, a fact, you know, it's just a, a given fact of life that you're going to need to deal with some volatility. But the more you can reduce that, the better off you're going to be. And then bonds, which were the typical safety net, that investors would use, that whether you were a pension or an endowment or an individual or a client or, or my mom, 
bonds, they really can't deliver the kinds of returns that we need them to because interest rates are so low. And that was, that was the biggest kind of frustration for, for me as an advisor is, you know, before when interest rates and you could get five, six percent on a CD, it was no problem for individual investors to make things work. But as interest rates just started to come down and down and down, that's when these institutions were able to achieve their return objectives, but the individuals weren't. And so that was the, the real problem that, that I wanted to solve. <clears throat> so solution number one, this is a tried and true. This is what pensions will do. This is what endowments will do. They'll, they'll act on systematic withdrawals. And the typical thing that I want you to remember is 4%. It's the rule of 4%. So if you have capital, or an investment base, and you need to pull income from it, if you pull 4.5%, it's, it's easier to remember just the rule of 4%, but if you can, you can actually pull 4% out of that portfolio, 4.5%, year after year after year, grow it with inflation, and you will not run out of money. They've, they've gone back and they've tested this over every single different environment. If you retired on the day before the Great Depression occurred, or the day before the tech crack, or the day before the credit crisis, it doesn't matter. If you pull no more than 4.5% out of your portfolio, you're going to be OK. But you got to keep it simple, right? Don't chase the shiny object. Don't, don't chase high returns. Don't chase for, for sexy you know, investment solutions. Don't, don't go after that thing that's going to cause you stomach acid and pain. Go after high quality investments that you know can perform over time. It doesn't mean they're going to perform this year or the next year, but if you're invested in a strategy that's been time tested and proven over time, you're going to work, you know, you're going to be okay. This is um, Ms. Warren Buffett here. So, rule number one never lose money. Rule number two don't forget rule number one. And, and, um, it just kind of goes to, to show, you know, if you lose 50%, you got to get 100% to get back to even. If you lose 40%, you got to get almost 70% back to even. So it's too much work in order to overcome those, those, those losses. Don't do it, right? So, so invest in things that you know can perform. It doesn't mean they're going to perform this year, but you know that they're going to be there and perform. <clears throat> So let's look at, suppose a couple sells their home for $2 million, they've amassed all of their 401ks, their plans, they have $2 million, and they want to earn, and, and this is that 4.5% rule. So they're going to take out 4.5% per year out of their portfolio, $90,000 a year. We're going to pay some taxes. This couple is going to live in California, so they're going to pay some serious taxes, and, and, um, and we'll see how they do if they invested in a typical portfolio of stocks and bonds. So 40% in the bond market, 60% in the stock market, and this is what you end up with. You start with 2 million, you end with 2.1 million, um, so you, you had a little bit of return, but you're able to pull almost $1.2 million in income over those 15 years, and this is what, what I wanted to do here was I wanted to pick two very serious market corrections in order to show. So we had the 2000s tech wreck in the beginning, we had the, uh, the credit crisis where the stock market dropped almost 60% in, from 2007 or 2009, over that time period. And still, they ended up able to achieve that, that income goal. Not without a serious amount of panic, mind you, right? In 2008, they went from 2 million down to 1.4 million. And you can bet your bottom that these people were calling their financial advisors and saying, get me out. Get me out at all costs. But if they stuck to the plan, they would have made out. And, and I think this is um, probably pro the, one of the worst scenarios that you could ever experience. However, it works, right? So investing in stocks, bonds in this case, living through these, these turbulent times, and you're still going to end up with enough income in order to survive that credit crisis. In, in fact, their income grew because inflation was, was coming in, so, so they ended up earning more than $90,000 towards the end, right? That's, um, that's kind of the case study 
that I think that's the perfect case study. But it doesn't matter if you picked over the 19, you know, from 70s over the Great Depression. It always works. That's the thing that's most important. And it, I think what's most critical is people think, if I want to earn four and a half, or if I need to earn $90,000 a year on my portfolio, shouldn't I invest in investments that pay 4.5% per year? And that is the critical flaw in most people's retirement plans, is they're trying to find investments that yield 4.5% for in this example, instead of thinking about it as a holistic portfolio that they can pull money from once a year, twice a year. It, it doesn't, you know, it, it, however often you want to do it, you can set it up for monthly, quarterly, or annually, and it still works as long as you're pulling that money out of the account, putting it into the money market, living off of it in the money market, instead of trying to put the whole portfolio into a bond that pays 4.5%. Because the problem there is that's never going to grow with inflation. And that's, that's the biggest challenge that I think we face right now with the bond market yielding almost 2%. You just can't do 4.5% if you own just bonds for, that pay income. And if you start chasing around for yield and looking at utility stocks or some of these other things, you're also going to end up running into trouble because you have all that volatility with it. So now let's, um, let's see if we can make it better. So we focus exclusively on dividend growth for, for really one reason, because dividend growers are better. Companies that can grow their dividends are better than companies who can't, period. Flat out, end of story, they're better. And what do I mean by better? More profitable, more stable, less volatile, and less uncertainty around it, right? If a company can grow its dividends year after year after year, and you can find that company, that's the hard part, you're going to be less volatile because, and you're going to be less uncertain about the future because you know that the business is profitable. You know that the business can sustain that payment to you as a shareholder. You own a piece of that business. And so the more your income can rise, the more trusted and, and knowledge that you have in your future about being able to say, sell it in the future should you need to. So we, um, we and, and Ned Davis actually did a study that went back over 50 years and looked at the S&P 500 and broke it out into four different categories, dividend growers, dividend payers, but stable dividend payers, dividend cutters, and then the non-dividend payers. And here's what you found. So this is that more, right? Giving you more of what you want. So dividend growers outperformed all other categories massively. In fact, um, the, the slide's wrong here, but 60 to one in, in terms, so a dollar invested in the dividend cutters would have been $60 cheaper, like basically a dollar 40 years later, versus if you'd have invested in the dividend growers, it would have been worth $60. So 60 times more capital in the dividend growers than the dividend cutters, that makes sense. I think we could all agree that that would naturally make sense. But what about the actual stable dividend payers, these companies that pay high but stable dividends? You have performed almost three to one, right? So you have $6,000 now if you'd have invested 100 40 years ago in the dividend growers and only $3,000 or $2,000 if you'd have invested in just stable dividend payers and reinvested all those dividends. So dividend growers, much, much more profitable. And less volatile. This is the, the, the thing. I'm not sure if any of you were in my presentation yesterday, but I, I brought up a story about when, um, when we were potty, potty training our kids and, and there was this book, Everybody Poops. And I remember, you know, my kids, my son, for, for a year, loved to say the word poop <laughs> everywhere. Well, this, this category over here, the non-dividend paying stocks and the cutters and eliminators, that's the poop, right? That's what you want to avoid in your portfolio investments. Avoid the poop because they're more volatile. That's what that bottom axis is. Farther you go out to the right is the more stomach acid that you're going to suffer through. And they offer less return. That's the, so you really want to be up here and to the left instead of down here and to the right. Poop on the right and, and quality on, on the left. And that's kind of how we think about the world, is dividend growers offer more 
and they, and they give you more of the things that you want and they and give you less of the things that you don't want. But that's not really good enough because that was entirely based on a rear view mirror approach. That was, I mean, that was assuming that you were smart enough to pick the dividend growers at the beginning of every year and then sell them at the end of every year. But that's not, hard, that's not easy to do. And, that, and there was really no one else out there that was doing that. Again, kind of coming back to, to why I wanted to leave my career at Morgan Stanley and to offer these solutions to people. Because every strategy out there that says it's a dividend growth strategy, every single one of them is focused on the rear view mirror. They'll say, these are the companies that have grown their dividends for 25 years in a row. These are the companies that have grown their dividends for 10 years in a row. These are the companies that grew their dividends for five years. That doesn't matter because as soon as they stop growing their dividends, that's when the performance you know, starts to suffer. And if you could identify those companies, you had something, right? So think about it like a football. If, if you were to just take the entire universe of, of NFL athletes, very strong group of people, right? Very, very talented group of people, all the, the NFL athletes. That's the dividend growth universe. So of all companies that grow their dividends, just think of them as, um, as kind of NFL. But what if you could identify what characteristics made each one of those players a leader amongst its own peer group, right? So if you could just build yourself a model that predicted and, and looked at all the analysis, whether their stats, their health, their their um, injuries, all of the different stats that, that made this NFL player the leader in their position, and you built a team of those leaders, right? You'd be unstoppable. That, that'd be like the dream team of, of the NFL. We did the same thing with the dividend stocks. We call this system DivCon. It's based on like the, the DEFCON system, five, four, three, two, one. We took all of the factors, we analyzed over 300 different factors of every single company going all the way back to the 70s and what made it a dividend grower versus a dividend cutter, right? What are those characteristics that define each company based on their ability to grow their dividends? And we came up with about seven factors that really drive future dividend growth. Not historical, right? Future dividend growth. And then we did the homework and we did the research. We rank all the companies and then we rate them five, four, three, two, one. One being worst, five being the best, the leaders. And then we built an ETF that's affordable, that doesn't have any high minimums, that you can own in, in your own portfolio and um, in one simple trade. And that's, that's really kind of, you know, speaks to the essence of, again, what we do as a firm. So the ticker is LEAD, L-E-A-D, and it's based on these, these leading dividend growth companies. There's about 50 companies that make the screen. And later in the presentation, I'll show you how to get on our website and to where you can look at your own stock portfolio and look at some of the ratings. And feel free to, to also stop by our booth and ask the team to show you how those tools work. So let's put it to the test. So in the DivCon leaders portfolio, you would have outperformed the market. This is going back about 15 or 16 years. You would have outperformed the market by almost 4% per year on a regular basis. And that's the market. That's the S&P 500, right? And that's the, the benchmark that everybody's trying to beat. These dividend growers in the leaders portfolio would have beaten the market year after year after year and a lot less volatile than the market with much higher returns. The laggards on the right there are, are those companies at the very bottom. That's the poop, right? That, those are the ones who, who come up in the screen as having the very worst attributes in the portfolio. L-E-A-D. Yeah, lead. Not yet. So now, now we're going to do that same 60-40 allocation, but this time we're going to invest in the leaders, the dividend leaders, instead of the S&P 500. And we're going to pull that same level of income out of the portfolio. Now you end up with almost 4 million, 3.8 million in your portfolio. Same level of income, so you were able to take out the same you know, use and enjoyment that you wanted every year. And at the low point, you never crossed below 2 million, right? So you didn't have 
any of that pain and suffering. You, you weren't calling, freaking out about what am I going to do you know, with my portfolio? Should I sell? Is it time? You didn't have any of those problems with the portfolio. Again, because of the higher quality nature of these, these stocks. Here's kind of the, the breakdown of, of doing it with the S&P 500 or doing it with dividend leaders. And you, so you see you know, massive amounts of excess capital in your portfolio, so you have a, a very good ending balance. And you can still continue to pull that same level of income. And then from the peak to the valley, your biggest drawdown, so the, this is looking at every single day from the highest water point that, that the water ever got to all the way to the bottom, total loss in the dividend growth portfolio was only 15% versus the S&P 500, it would have lost almost 25%. So, um, so that's systematic withdrawals. That's making systematic withdrawals better because you're not using just the, the mediocrity of the S&P 500, which is really like grab the entire NFL team, essentially, where we're just selecting only those leaders. But the next problem is, is how do you how do you estimate what's going to happen in the bond portfolio, right? We've, we've got a real significant problem here, and, and we have to be sensible. So, warning, you're headed for a disaster. Do you want to make a change? And everything else is blanked out except for no. Don't do what we've always done just because we've always done it. You have to think differently, and you have to look at what those institutional investors are doing. Right now, STRS, Cal STRS, which is the um, state teachers retirement system, they have well in excess of $10 billion in, in portfolio assets. They have less than 15% of their portfolio invested in bonds. Yale, which is the um, really kind of the, the pinnacle of, of the profession for managing endowment assets. Yale's had the best returns of any endowment out of all of them, including Harvard and their allocation to fixed income or bonds is less than 10% right now. If, if your financial advisor is telling you that you need 40% of your portfolio or 60% of your portfolio in fixed income or bonds, they're, they're flat out wrong and, and, and you, should, you should really consider asking them the question of why. Because you wouldn't, you wouldn't consciously do something that gives you less of what you want and more of what you don't want, less returns, more volatility. That's exactly what we're getting with the bond market right now. And yet we see inflows into bond ETFs and bond mutual funds at a rapid pace. And I think what it is is just people doing the same old thing just because that's what they've always done. And that's, that's a real problem here. So here's a... Um, Here's a chart of interest rates, and for those of you who can't see it, basically what you, you see here is for 40 years, interest rates have gone down. Bonds are a seesaw. It's, it's really um, pretty simple. As interest rates go down, bond prices go up. As interest rates go up, bond prices go down. So if I invest in a bond that pays me 2% today, and and it's going to mature in 10 years, and interest rates go to 4%, that bond will become less valuable because no one will want to buy it from me, right? Yes, it'll mature. I'll still get my money back in 10 years. But unfortunately, when I look at my statement on my brokerage account, I'm going to see a 20%, or in that case, uh, yeah, 20% loss on that bond. 20% on a bond, on the safe money, right? That's a lot more of what you don't want instead of what you do want, which is higher returns and better profitability and, and less volatility. So this is the old asset allocation. This is the traditional stocks and bonds. Stocks were the return enhancers. Bonds were the risk reducers. It's broken, and you need to change it, and you need to consider different ways in order to change it. If, if you look at the bond market as a whole, sure we're doing well yeah so if you look at the bond market as a whole especially in mutual funds which I consider to be individual investors primarily like ourselves there's almost 500 bond funds that have a, a duration we call it of, of 10 years or more there's 600 billion dollars invested in those bond funds 
$600 billion. If the 10-year Treasury goes from 2.3% where it is today to 4.3%, which is not a big move, and it could certainly happen, you're going to see almost $130 billion wiped out in a heartbeat. That's, that's the kind of risk that I'm talking about. It's no longer a risk reducer. And, and it's just, it's just um, again, it's math. It's, it's just math. What's that? Well, that's precisely it. And, and so obviously you have to hold on. And unfortunately with the bond funds, they'll sell those bonds. So you can't keep it to maturity, right? But if you own the bonds individually, sure, you can hold it to maturity. But what if you're pulling capital out of your account, that interest rate, you're only getting 2%. And that's the big, that's the big rub, is, is the income that these bonds are producing is too low, so you end up having to, to dig into your principal. And even if it's not too low, then you have this other issue of all the volatility in your statement where, where um, really you're not, you don't need to, that, because there's other alternatives. That's the, I think, the biggest point, is look at what these institutions are doing. 10, 15% allocations to bonds, that's fine, because that's kind of the money that they may need to get at, or that's doing something to produce some, some inflation hedge or some other risk. But the rest of the portfolio is either in stocks, the equity market, or alternative investments. And now there's more and more alternative investments that are coming into the market that individuals can access. So traditionally, it was hedge funds and private equity funds and, and all of these different alternatives that really we couldn't get access to, that my clients could access, but I couldn't access, or my clients could access, but my mom couldn't access. But now you're starting to see more and more alternatives come to the market in the form of mutual funds and ETFs that can deliver that alternative source of return. And so you don't need to invest as much in the bond market as a risk reducer. And that's where we see alternatives fitting is kind of in, in between as a risk reducer, but also as a return enhancer. And so I guess um, with that, I'll, I'll close it up. So we, we just want to make sure that we think more about how to add more stability to the portfolio. You do that with companies that are high quality, that can grow their dividends. You do that by reducing some of the exposure that you have to the bond market, because that's a one-way train and, and it's not coming back. That 40-year um, that bull market in bonds is over. It may not be a bear market coming, but it's certainly not going to offer the returns that you need in order to produce the kind of investment income that you need in your portfolio. And that's where alternatives fit. Is, is really as a solution to offer that, that alternative to the bond market. And we have, um, I mentioned LEED in the earlier part of the presentation. So we have four ETFs. LEED is that stock market alternative. That's the leading dividend growth companies. Defend, Guard, and Divi, which I didn't talk about, but those are alternative investments. So those you can think of as in, in between the stock and bond from a risk perspective. It's a little bit lower on the risk, a little bit lower on the volatility, but more on the stability offering kind of those returns that you might have otherwise expected from the bond market. And I guess with that, I'll just open it up. Oh, you know what? One thing I wanted to show you. So I know, I don't know how many of you are stock investors invest in individual companies. Okay. So here's the, the tools on our website at realitysharesadvisors.com. So you can go in on the DivCon tab and you can type in any ticker and we'll tell you the dividend health of that stock. And if you want, we can even, if you email us or, or there's some postcards at, at our booth, if you want to fill in some of the stocks that, that you're curious about, we can run those scores and email them back to you. Or even if you give us an ETF or a mutual fund, particularly if you want to look at one that's, that maybe is your favorite dividend grower, and we'll screen all of the holdings in that ETF or mutual fund in order to tell you what the DivCon score is on average for the entire fund. 
portfolio. So I strongly urge you, I mean, we build a lot of great stuff. We just want to share it. We want, to, we want people to get more of what they want, right? They want information. They want research. And that's really what we wanted to deliver. And so with our website, there's a ton of great resources and tools there for anyone to go on. Here's, um, yeah. what's that? 704. So I guess with that, it's um, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, the, um, cor correct. The Got, okay, so I'll just um, repeat the question just so everyone can hear. So the question is, is these ETFs haven't been out because, as, as I mentioned, I was at Morgan Stanley for all those years, and we launched these ETFs in 2012 and, and 13 and 14. They haven't experienced, bless you, they haven't experienced a full bear market or a full market correction. So what are we doing as, as a firm to make sure that, that they stand up to kind of their promise, which is to deliver more of what you want and less of what you don't want? Is that, yeah. So one of the things that, um, that's fundamental to, to our firm is, is to, to make sure that everything is research-based and to take the human element out of as much of it as possible. So these funds are all based on an index. That index goes all the way back to 2001. If you, if you have a rules-based index and there's no human, you know, no, no wizard behind the curtain pulling the levers, you don't have to worry as much about whether or not it's going to work in the next cycle, right? It's just the research. So if, if it's based on sound fundamental research and that index is developed, then our job as an ETF manager is to track the index, to make sure that we're doing everything we can to get as tight to that index as possible. And that's exactly what we do. So that the difference in from leads performance to leads index performance is 0.001%. That's the, the slippage that that we might experience off of that index. So the indexes go all the way back and have been through kind of those, those environments that you're talking about, 2001, 2002, 2008. In fact, in, in the 2000 timeframe, the, the peak to valley there from a drawdown perspective was only, I think, 7% versus the market was down almost 40% over that timeframe. And then in 2008, when you know, when we saw uh, like a 60% drop in the S&P 500 from peak to valley, the drop in these dividend growth leaders, that index, was down only um, around 30%. So it's still down, but, but down only around 30%. Yeah? So do you, do you say that you would just uh, take ETFs and composition of them based on market conditions from time to time? There's, uh, so, all three ETFs are a little bit different, but, but they're all based on the, the, all three ETFs on the left, lead, defend, and guard, are all based on that DivCon system. That DivCon system is the one that ranks companies based on their dividend health, and they're, they're rebalanced once a year. So, so we update the ratings every month, if you want to go on the website and look, but the, the portfolio is, is rebalanced once a year based on the new healthiest dividend growers. And just, just to put, point it out, I guess, you know, speaking of corrections, so our biggest competitors in lead are uh, Noble, N-O-B-L is the ticker, it's the Dividend Aristocrats Index. So that's all the companies in the S&P 500 that have increased their dividend for 25 years in a row. VIG is, um, is the other index that, the, or ETF that we compete against. It's the Dividend Achievers Index, all the companies that have increased their dividend 10 years in a row. In 2008, 30% of both of those indexes cut their dividends. You had almost 30 companies cut in the, um, or sorry, 14 companies cut in the Dividend Aristocrats Index, and, and I think uh, around 100 companies cut in the Dividend Achievers Index. Again, it's that rear view mirror approach, right? If, if you're only looking at the past, 
you're not doing what you need to do. You would never drive a car by just looking in the rearview mirror. You'd run into a brick wall, right? That's what 99% of all of the dividend growth strategies out there do. And in DivCon or in the leader's portfolio, zero. Not a single company cut its dividend. Yeah? What are your managers? Yeah, that's correct. So um, again, kind of wanting to offer the, the institutional solution so that was accessible to individuals. So 43 basis points for lead, so 0.43% for lead. And then Defend, Guard, and Divi are all at 0.85%. And that's, that's just to contrast, you know, really those are the same strategies that would normally be offered in a hedge fund and, and for 2% and 20% of the profits, which is just asinine in, in, in any um, environment like we are today. You know, stocks are not going up 20 and 30%. Hedge funds can't do that anymore, yet they still try to. So that's why we wanted to keep those fees as low as possible. Yeah? What alternatives do you use? In uh, defend and guard, there's a, there's a long and short exposure, so we're hedging by shorting the stocks, the poop, the stocks that are most likely to cut their dividends. And in Divi, Divi's a, a little bit different. So Divi is designed to produce 3 to 5% per year better than, than what you'd get in your savings account, basically better than T-bills. So on an absolute return. In other words, if we don't do that, then, then fire us. That's, that's what Divi's job is. Much like a hedge fund, we call it absolute return because it's not relative to the market, relative, well, I was only up 4%, but the market was only up 1%. We, we don't want to say that, and, and I hated that excuse as whenever I would talk to clients. So Divi offers this 3 to 5% return regardless of market conditions. It invests in a dividend security that, that just tracks the growth rate of the S&P 500 dividend. So, yeah, question in the back. Great question. So the question is, is, in LEED, has there ever been any capital gains distributions? And so LEED, is, and this is another reason why we wanted to launch it in an ETF. So LEED, because we're rebalancing the portfolio once a year, you're going to have more turnover in, in the portfolio, which in a mutual fund would be horrible because we'd be paying out all those capital gains distributions to the individuals who didn't care to buy or sell. They just had to pay the tax now. In an ETF, though, we're able to pass that on to the institutions and the market makers. That's why ETFs are so much better than, than mutual funds as a whole. So we can trade the entire portfolio, which in general it only trades about 60 to 70 percent turnover. But we can trade that entire portfolio without distributing any capital gains distributions. So in, in this last year, there was zero capital gains distributions. Yeah, one more question. Yeah. So, uh, um, so reality should, we charge 43 basis points for for the lead ETF and 0.85. So 0.43 percent for lead and 0.85 for the other three. And and um, to your question earlier, is that the only way we make money? Yes, that is the only way we make money. Did you say you had two? Is there any way to rethink something? Yeah, well, that's where, um, so again, that, that four and a half percent rule is, is the, the bulletproof rule. That's, but sometimes we just don't, we can't, we can't do that. We need more money. The roof leaks or, or whatever happens. So now you got to take a little bit of risk. And, and, and I wouldn't suggest investing the portfolio differently. I would more suggest taking the additional income and, and trying to keep it as close to. And, and if you go back and you say, what if I earned 6% or what if I took out 6%, that is, um, I think, 80% effective. So 80% of the periods, you're fine. But there's a 20% chance that you're going to run out of money. And there's a lot of tools online where you can do scenario analysis. There's something called Monte Carlo simulation, which which is pretty cool. If, if you just Google it, it's, um, it basically what it does is it says, out of 
5,000 different iterations, will my portfolio hold up to, to my need, my income need? Yes? How many stocks are in need Yeah, so the question is, is how many stocks are in lead and then how many stocks get, get removed or, or taken out each year? So the lead portfolio has 50 stocks in it right now. Now that's, that's a coincidence, that's not, it's not because we hold it to 50. So there were only 50 stocks that made the cut and, and made the dream team essentially. Last year there were 34 stocks that made the cut. And of the, so it, it, that's kind of a sign of, of the health of the market, which, which you can think about, you know, companies are getting more healthy, they're, they're more profitable, there's more, just, so that's a good sign to see that. Doesn't mean stocks are gonna go up, it just means that companies are doing better and generally that leads to performance. And then each year, about 70 to 80% of the portfolio will get kicked out. So, so you're a leader today, but that doesn't mean you're going to be a leader 12 months from now. In fact, most likely, you might not be a leader 12 months from now. And that's the, I, I think, like that's one of the, um, the great things about this system is it's constantly refreshing and it's constantly looking at, you know, can this company deliver? Can this company perform? Is it one of the best companies? Instead of, well, they raised their dividend for 25 years. Must be a good company. That's the... Um, Kind of the beauty of the system is it's constantly refreshing and giving you only the, those leading companies, those companies that are most likely to perform. And that's why it was able to deliver, you know, almost double what the, the S&P 500 was able to deliver. Is it's just it's just owning the best of the best each year. That the dividends, the dividends, the dividends. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't even see you there. Sorry. Yeah, so um, the question is, is what month do we rebalance and how long does it take to do the rebalance? If, if, um, so it's the first Friday of, of December every year. And, and the way that the index is, is struck is the entire portfolio gets, um, so we track the index. And so it's our obligation as a firm, you know, in an ETF to track that index. So on, say, Friday night, it, it, um, it strikes a new portfolio. Friday night, that very same day, we, the ETF manager, strike the new portfolio. So we sell all the holdings of the old portfolio and buy all the holdings of the new portfolio that night in order to track that index perfectly. So there's no like portfolio manager that's working trades or anything like that. That's what keeps the cost down so low in an ETF. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, so the question is, is um, I think, the question is regarding the, the weighting. Does, like right now, if there's 50 companies, does every single company get 2% of the portfolio or is it balanced in a different way? And that is, um, is also part of the performance and is every single company is ranked based on that DivCon score and th that, that you know, dividend health score. And the companies with the highest rank have the highest weight in the portfolio and on down to the lowest. So even the 50 get ranked based on their own, you know, best of the best ability. And the ones who are the strongest, that'd be like a Starbucks, Nike, Tyson Foods, um, a lot of these, it's just, just really strong, healthy dividend growers or companies that can grow their dividend in the future. Those are the ones that have the highest weight in the portfolio. Yeah. Yeah, um, so the question is, is uh, if, if we're in a terrible environment and only 10 stocks make the cut, what do you do with, with the portfolio? Do you, do you allocate maybe 50% of the portfolio to those 10 stocks and then the rest goes to cash or, or is there a different system? And, 
and the way that the, the rules of the index work is it, there's a minimum of 30 companies. So there's always going to be at least 30 companies, even if you have to dip down into the DivCon 4. And that happened uh, about two times during the, the last 15 or 16 years. And there were only around three companies that, you know, so it was never that bad, but, um, but it can happen. And at that point, we'll just have some DivCon 4s. The DivCon 4s, though, would, would have a lower weighting even still, you know. I think that's it for questions. So, yeah, perfect. We, we, we did it exactly at, um, on time. So, well, thank you all for coming. I really want to encourage you to stop by the booth, get, get some, some cool toys and, and some pens and shirts. And if you have any questions whatsoever about any of our ETFs or how to use the website, get more information. That's what we're here for. We just want to share good, good quality stuff. So thanks again.